Hi, I'm Dr. Seema Yasmin, and from 2011 to 2013, I was an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. So today, I'm gonna match the timeline of contagion with the timeline of COVID-19. Contagion starts on day two, and we see Gwyneth Paltrow's character is sick, and then a montage of other sick civilians, all demonstrating symptoms within one day of transmission. Everyone we see who gets sick with this has a cough, a fever, seizures, and then dies within three to four days. The virus in Contagion is fictional, it's called MEV1, but it is a hybrid of two real-life infections, influenza and Nipah. Nipah is a real-life virus, a very serious one that can cause fever, shortness of breath, swelling of the brain, coma and seizures. The illness caused by MEV1 is very different to COVID-19, where people get sick over the course of 2 to 14 days. And unlike the fictional virus in Contagion, death from COVID-19 isn't typically so sudden. Hey, so in this scene, we're looking at day five, which is the day that the World Health Organization is notified of the outbreak. What we are hearing from Beijing is that the outbreak is contained to the chrysanthemum complex in Hong Kong. We're also looking at samples from London, two clusters. Here's the first time that they use the word cluster. And that can refer to cases that are literally clustered together in time and place. We still don't know who was the first person to become infected with SARS-CoV-2 and when that was. But we do know that Chinese officials alerted the World Health Organization on December 31st of 2019. Then it would be day 21 when the United States identified its first cases. On day six in Contagion, the CDC learns of a cluster of cases at an elementary school in Minnesota. There's a cluster in an elementary school. And we start hearing here some very familiar language. We're isolating the sick and quarantining those who we believe were exposed. And that's exactly what happened here in the US. People who had symptoms were isolated from others, and those who were exposed to those who had symptoms were then quarantined. The average person touches their face two or 3,000 times a day. Two or 3,000 times a day? So in this scene, we have Kate Winslet playing an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, the job that I used to have, and she's talking to health officials at the Minnesota Department of Health. I think we have to believe this is respiratory. Maybe fomites too. What's that, fomites? This is stuff they would already know, especially when you're looking at the fact that it's the Minnesota Department of Health, which is known to be one of the best departments of health in the country. It refers to transmission from surfaces. Fomites are inanimate objects and surfaces, things like a door handle or a light switch. Those things become fomites. One of the things that's very silly to me about Contagion is that Kate Winslet is sent on her own to investigate this epidemic. In real life, with something of this magnitude, with a novel infection, you'd be sent with a team, not alone. Epidemic investigations are all about teamwork. For every person who gets sick, how many other people are they likely to infect? We call that number the R0. Her description of R0 is accurate. R stands for the reproductive rate of the virus. R0 is the basic reproductive number of an infection, which means the average number of people one infected person will go on to infect in a susceptible population. Once it gets to below one, meaning that one infected person is on average infecting fewer than one people, that's when you see an epidemic stop because you're breaking the chain of transmission. The R0 of SARS-CoV-2 is thought to be somewhere between 1.5 and 3.5. We did Pilates together. I called her after she got back. I never heard from her. So you had no contact with her? In this scene, the Epidemic Intelligence Service officer is doing what we call contact tracing. With contact tracing, you first talk to the person who is sick, and then you find out when were they contagious. Did she go to the class? I, I didn't see her there. Then you follow up on that long list of people. Is there anyone else who might have had contact with her? One thing that I do find strange about the current COVID-19 pandemic is here in the States, contact tracing got shifted to the back burner, almost as if officials were saying, there's too much spread and now it's too difficult to do contact tracing. And compare that to South Korea, where there's been very thorough contact tracing for every single person who's shown symptoms. In this scene, the researchers are talking about sequencing the virus in the movie. We've sequenced the virus and determined its origin, and we've modeled the way it enters the cells of the lung and the brain. And sequencing is where you analyze the genetic material inside the virus. The virus contains both bat and pig sequences. Here they're analyzing the protein structure of the virus. Blue is virus, and the gold is human, and the red is the viral attachment protein, and the green is its receptor in the human cells. This kind of molecular structuring rendering is accurate. 
Researchers look at 3D models like this to determine how a virus invades human cells. So we have a novel virus with a mortality rate in the low 20s. No treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. That is correct. It is accurate to say there are novel characteristics because that's what you say when you're dealing with a very new virus, one which you haven't seen anything quite like it before. Sequencing a virus is really important so that you can develop a test for it. The test that we typically use is called PCR, which means polymerase chain reaction. And the way it works is you take a sample from somebody's nose, for example, and then you are putting it through this system that amplifies the genetic material inside the virus. And they did this really quickly within 10 days in the movie, which is pretty close to what we saw in real life with SARS-CoV-2, where Chinese scientists had sequenced the genome by January 7th. And that's about day eight of our timeline. And this timeline actually matches up pretty well with the movie. He grew it. He tried antibodies and immunological knockout lines like we did, but the key was a fetal bat cell line from Geelong. This scene is really accurate because if you can't grow the virus inside a laboratory, then you're not able to study it, propagate it, and really understand what it looks like, how it behaves, and how you might treat it. But the key was a fetal bat cell line from Geelong. We didn't have it. And the scientist says they were able to successfully grow the virus inside cells that came from bat lungs. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it was also successfully propagated early on in the lab using a different kind of cell, though it used kidney cells that came from a specific kind of monkey. This is a really important step in terms of developing treatments and vaccines for a new virus. So here's a really great question that one of the characters asks. If I'm immune, can't you use my blood to cure this? This is something we actually do in medicine. It's a technique that dates back to the Victorian times where say somebody survived an infection with a virus, you can take their blood, separate the antibodies out of it, those are the proteins that helped them fight off the infection, and give those antibodies to others to help them. It's often a stopgap measure that's used during epidemics, like with the Ebola epidemic of 2014. We didn't have any specific treatments, we didn't have a vaccine. So while all of that stuff was being developed, we took blood from Ebola survivors and used that blood to treat and protect others. For SARS-CoV-2, there are currently studies looking into antibody treatments where blood transfers could help sick people fight off the virus. On day 13 in Contagion, they report more than 3,000 cases in the suburbs of Minneapolis. But 3,000 cases have been confirmed in the western suburbs. In our timeline, on March 26, Washington state officials announced more than 3,200 cases in the state. And that would be day 65 since the first case in the US was reported. Again, it just shows how different the disease is in the movie compared to COVID-19. Around day 13, Dr. Mia sets up a temporary hospital in a public space. I want 25 rows, 10 beds apiece, the most febrile cases at this end. And they say that it needs to be operational within 24 to 48 hours. We'll need to be operational within the next 24 to 48 hours. This scene actually does match up with what we saw happen in New York City, which quickly became the American epicenter of the pandemic. In March, New York Governor Cuomo announced that the Javits Center would be converted into an emergency hospital. And the Army Corps of Engineers went went in and converted that space into a 2,000 bed makeshift hospital. In real life though, it took over a week to set that up, not the 48 hours that we see in the movie. We call these kinds of hospitals mobile field hospitals and many states and countries will have plans in place to make those appear quickly in the case of an emergency. In this scene, CDC scientists are tracking down the index patient. Are we any closer to an index patient? Could be your Beth Emhoff or the guy on the bus in Japan, someone else who crawled off the grid. And they find out that it's Gwyneth Paltrow's character, Beth. Emhoff is the index patient. Index patient is a term that you may hear used interchangeably with the term patient zero. When I was in the epidemic intelligence service, I was taught that the index case is the first case that you identify, but patient zero is the true first case in the epidemic. In this scene, there's a health investigator watching video footage of who they think is their index case in a casino. Okay, okay. It's transmission. 
so we just need to know which direction. With SARS-CoV-2, the investigation is still ongoing and we don't know who the first human cases were or where and how they became infected. There was a lot of finger pointing early on at a particular seafood market in Wuhan, but some of the genetic analysis and the epidemiologic analysis shows that actually there were people infected earlier on who may have had no contact with that particular market. Similarly to the casino in Contagion, there have been outbreaks of COVID-19 traced back to densely populated areas and places like a church in South Korea. So I wanna call out something from the movie that is pure Hollywood. Kate Winslet's character, playing the role of the officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, dies from the very virus that she is investigating. And as far as I know, this has never happened in the 69 year history of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. In this scene, the media starts talking about a drug called ribavirin. The drug ribavirin has been shown to be effective against this virus. This is a real life medication that fights viruses and it's been around for a really long time. And similarly with the COVID-19 timeline, the president of the US did bring up an existing old school medicine and asked if that would work against the new coronavirus. So the drug that he mentioned was hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which are old school malaria drugs also used nowadays to treat lupus and some types of arthritis. There is little evidence that hydroxychloroquine is a reliable treatment for COVID-19. There are therapies we know are effective right now, like for Scythia. Jude Law plays this really sleazy character who's saying that they cured themselves using a kind of homeopathic treatment and then trying to sell this to others and profit from it. This is for Scythia. If I'm here tomorrow, you'll know it works. I'm not the first person to make money of the fact that our immune system is a work in progress. This is really common during epidemics and pandemics. With COVID-19, we've seen internet personalities and people like Alex Jones, no surprise, peddling fake cures and trying to profit off the crisis. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did you come from? In this scene, CDC scientists find out that by day 21, the virus has mutated. It's mutated. A phylogenetic analysis is basically like creating a family tree for a pathogen to figure out where it originated from and how it evolved. The Durban cluster is highly divergent. What they're talking about there is the virus has mutated so much that it looks very different to the original strains. We have a new R0, Ellis. It's not two anymore. And then we hear that the R0 has changed. It's not two anymore. And that that can definitely happen during the course of an epidemic. The R0 can increase and decrease. Ideally, it decreases because of all the interventions you're putting into place, like physical distancing, health education, development of a vaccine. Those things drive the R0 down. We tried using dead virus combined with several adjuvants to boost immune response. And no protective antibodies, a lot of dead monkeys. So here, the researchers are failing in their attempts to produce protective antibodies to the virus. A live attenuated virus is a virus that's still alive, but one that you've tweaked so it can't be as potent. Combined with several adjuvants. Adjuvants. Adjuvants are chemicals that we add into vaccines to stimulate your immune system so that the vaccine works. At this point with SARS-CoV-2, it's way too early in the vaccine trials to say whether any of those experimental vaccines actually work and produce protective antibodies in people. By day 26, the world is staying at home. This scene just shows a bunch of places that have emptied out, which kind of feels a bit overly familiar with what we're going through right now. As the death toll in the United States is now believed to have reached 2.5 million, the president issued a statement today from an undisclosed location. By day 29 in the contagion timeline, MEV1 has killed 2.5 million people in the United States. But in real life, by day 29 of the COVID-19 pandemic, there hadn't been any reported deaths from the virus in the US. And the current projection is that the virus could kill between 100,000 to 240,000 Americans. Some early models suggested that COVID-19 could kill more than 2 million Americans in a year if no measures were taken to stop the spread of the disease. If we even had a viable vaccine right now, we would still have to do human trials and that would take weeks. So the movie here portrays quite well, I think, the disconnect between scientists and the government. Then we would have to get clearance and approval 
figure out manufacturing and distribution that would take months. You see scientists working tirelessly to develop a vaccine, while government officials just don't understand that it takes a really long time to develop new vaccines. Homeland Security wants to know if we could put a vaccination in the water supply, like fluoride, cure everyone all at once. I'm going home now, Alice. And I have never heard of a vaccine being put in a water supply. We are seeing that with this emergency of COVID-19, that with some experimental vaccines, that whole testing it in animal stage is being skipped and we're going straight to phase one trials in humans. <laughs> In terms of a researcher acting as a human test subject for a vaccine, it could happen. It's pretty unusual though. In the movie, the FDA fast tracks the approval of the new vaccine. The Food and Drug Administration is accelerating approval of the MEV1 vaccine currently in production at five secret locations in the US and Europe. This can definitely happen in real life, both with a new vaccine or with new treatments. If the FDA believes there's a real need to, it can fast track approval. In the movie, and this is very Hollywood, the timeline jumps from day 29 when the researcher is acting as a test subject to day 131 when magically this new vaccine is being distributed to many people. And I think this creates a lot of false expectations and false hope around the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. There are ones being developed now, even some that are being tested in humans, but it's still too early to say when a vaccine would be available. I love how they end the movie. I think to me it's the most prescient part, showing the transmission of this new virus from a bat to a pig and then to humans. This is probably really close to how we're thinking about the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, probably from bats to some intermediate animal, maybe a pangolin, and then from that animal to humans, and then of course from one human to another until it's spread around the world. In the end, there's a lot of truth, I think, in the Contagion movie in terms of how a pandemic might play out across the world and in the US. But as you can see from watching this video, there's a fair amount of Hollywood liberties taken as well. I think some of the things that the movie did not predict were the lack of personal protective equipment available in developed nations like the US and the UK. And of course, the movie, like so many, focuses entirely on the United States, doesn't give us a really good grasp of how the pandemic plays out in different parts of the world. So did I miss any scenes that you're confused about or do you have any questions for me about what it was like doing that job? If so, please leave your questions here in the comment section or reach me on social media.